Hello everyone, it's Eric Strong from Stanford University and Strong Medicine. And today I'll be giving an overview to interstitial lung disease, also known as diffuse parenchymal lung diseases. After the video, you'll be able to describe the classification, etiologies, presentation, and diagnostic evaluation of interstitial lung disease. First though, what is interstitial lung disease? ILD is not one specific condition but rather refers to any disease affecting the pulmonary interstitium. In common usage, however, the term typically excludes infectious and neoplastic diseases. Pathologically, most ILDs are characterized by a combination of interstitial inflammation and fibrosis, as well as alterations of alveolar and airway architecture. If you've tried to study and understand ILDs before and have been frustrated by them, you are not alone. This is a frustrating topic, partially due to lots of acronyms and constantly evolving terminology. The lack of a universal and logical classification system doesn't help. Different systems place different weights on historical precedents, clinical presentation, radiographic and histological appearances, biological mechanisms, and treatment. What I'm going to show is my preferred way to classify these diseases, which may not be the most common way that pulmonologists and pathologists classify them, but which makes more sense to me as a more general clinician. I think about there being four main categories of disease. The first are those directly caused by exposures of some kind. In this category are hypersensitivity pneumonitis, also known as extrinsic allergic alveolitis. This condition is caused by an immune-mediated response to inhaled organic dust. There are many subtypes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis based upon the inhaled substance and which is generally named not after the associated microbe, but rather the occupation or hobby of the individuals who tend to get it. So for example, so-called farmer's lung caused by proximity to moldy hay and bird fancier's lung caused by proximity to bird feathers or excrement. There are many, many others. Next, under the general category of exposure-related ILD are the pneumoconioses. These are ILDs caused by inhalation of inorganic substances. The main substances implicated here are coal dust seen in miners, asbestos seen in construction workers, shipbuilders, and auto mechanics, particularly those who work on auto brakes, silica seen in miners, quarry workers, and stone carvers, and beryllium seen in a variety of industrial jobs. Radiation pneumonitis occurs as a consequence of radiation treatment for intrathoracic cancers. And a number of medications have been implicated as a potential cause of ILD, in particular the antirhythmic amiodarone, the antibiotic nitrofurantoin, and the immunosuppressive drug methotrexate. In the next broad category of ILDs are those secondary to connective tissue diseases which are systemic autoimmune conditions. These include systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, mixed connective tissue disease, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, and lupus. Of these, systemic sclerosis is the most likely to cause ILD, and lupus is the least likely. Next are the so-called idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. This is the category that learners and clinicians both find to be the most difficult to keep straight, because they have very similar presentations, differing only in time course, they have a poorly understood pathogenesis, and they have kind of ridiculous names, which are often abbreviated into acronyms. They are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, and acute interstitial pneumonia. And the last category is the miscellaneous one. Here we have sarcoidosis, vasculitis, two in particular, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, and the very similarly named eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as Churg-Strauss syndrome. There is eosinophilic pneumonia, which has both acute and chronic forms. Some classification systems actually leave this one out. And last, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So you can probably appreciate how some of the terminology feels a bit impenetrable. Making this more complicated is the fact that with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the term refers to the clinical entity, 
while the histologic pattern seen in IPF is called usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP. So you might have a pathologist saying, this patient's lung biopsy shows UIP consistent with IPF. And then, on top of all of this, the radiographic and histologic appearances of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias can be seen with other diseases, but when this happens, the names are only used to describe the pathology. So, for example, rheumatoid arthritis-related ILD is most commonly associated with a usual interstitial pneumonia histology and radiographic appearance, but you would not call it IPF if it's associated with RA. Likewise, systemic sclerosis is most commonly associated with an NSIP, pathologic and radiographic appearance. Finally, while we have all the etiologies up on the screen at once, let me label those which are observed almost solely in current or past smokers, which includes RBILD, DIP, and pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Okay, so all of that terminology, that was the hard part of the video. Now let's talk presentation. ILD should be considered in any patient presenting with symptoms of subacute or chronic progressive dyspnea and or a non-productive cough, particularly if they have a history of occupational or relevant animal exposure, which does not include dogs and cats, connective tissue disease, chest irradiation, or the use of medications such as amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, or methotrexate. Due to their diverse nature, ILDs also have a diverse presentation regarding age, sex, and racial predominance, relationship to smoking history, family history, acuity of onset, and radiographic appearance. However, there are some commonalities. As mentioned, the symptoms common to all ILDs are dyspnea and a non-productive cough. Common exam findings include hypoxemia, which might only be present during exertion, and fine crackles, sometimes described as dry or Velcro-like, in contrast to the wet coarse crackles of bronchiectasis and bacterial pneumonia. Fever is common in hypersensitivity pneumonitis and sarcoidosis, but is otherwise uncommon. Clubbing is generally only seen in advanced idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and if observed in a patient with relatively mild ILD, it should prompt an investigation for a possible lung malignancy. The presence of extra pulmonary symptoms or exam findings is suggestive of a connective tissue disease, vasculitis, or sarcoidosis. Hemoptysis, chest pain, and wheezing are all relatively uncommon symptoms, though they certainly can occur. For example, hemoptysis is a well-described presentation of granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Now, let's talk time course. Over how long do these diseases typically progress before the patient seeks medical attention and a diagnosis is hopefully made? I'm going to focus on five of the more common diagnoses. First, hypersensitivity pneumonitis has an enormous range from an acute illness developing just hours after a single heavy exposure to a chronic insidious form developing over years. The ILD seen in sarcoidosis typically develops over weeks to many months. Radiation causes two clinically distinct ILDs. Acute radiation pneumonitis occurs about one to three months after radiation exposure, while a chronic form of radiation pneumonitis, sometimes called radiation-induced pulmonary fibrosis, occurs about six to 12 months after radiation. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis develops over many months to several years. And last are the pneumoconioses, which typically take many years to develop and become clinically apparent. So once a clinician has identified a patient as possibly having an ILD, what type of diagnostic evaluation should occur? First, a very detailed exposure history needs to be taken. This includes the patient's current and prior occupations and their hobbies, asking about any potential chemical inhalations. If there may have been, also ask about the use of a respirator, or if they have noticed their symptoms improve on the weekends or while on vacation, when the exposures would not have occurred for several days. Ask about exposure to animals, particularly birds. Ask about medications, illicit drugs as well, such as smoking marijuana, amphetamines, or crack cocaine. And last, of course, prior radiation treatment. The four key diagnostic tests to consider include a high-resolution chest CT. The high-resolution part of it refers to the thickness of the cuts. The thinner the cuts, the better the ability to diagnose ILD. 
Pulmonary function tests should be ordered, including not just spirometry, but also lung volumes, and in most cases, a test called the Diffusing Capacity of Lungs for Carbon Monoxide, abbreviated DLCO. Bronchoalveolar lavage and lung biopsy are performed in some, but not all, patients, and is often considered when an ILD is rapidly progressing and the need to confirm a suspected diagnosis is urgent. Let's talk about the possible findings on lung imaging. Although I did not mention plain chest x-rays as a key diagnostic test, almost all patients with suspected ILD will, for one reason or another, get a chest x-ray prior to CT. So when discussing ILD, it's helpful to have a basic handle on the relevant radiographic terminology. As a very general rule, the appearance of interstitial opacities can be further described based on their pattern. A chest x-ray may demonstrate a reticular pattern, meaning there are too many lines within the lung fields. It's sometimes described as net-like. It may demonstrate a nodular pattern consisting of too many dots. Or if there are too many lines and too many dots to a roughly equal extent, it's described as reticulonodular. Here on the left is a patient with a predominantly reticular pattern from early pulmonary fibrosis. And for comparison, on the right is a predominantly nodular pattern from silicosis. As my inclusion of the word predominantly may imply, most chest x-rays in ILD have some degree of both reticular and nodular patterns, and the descriptive term chosen is based upon the subjective impression of whether one of the two patterns is more prominent than the other. When it comes to the high-resolution CT, there are a large number of potential findings, some more specific than others. They include ground glass opacities, which refers to regions of increased attenuation within the lung, meaning it looks whiter, while not totally obscuring the airways and vessels. So, for example, on this axial cross-section through the thorax, here is normal lung tissue, and here are the ground glass opacities. There can also be consolidations, which are regions of more significant attenuation, in which the airways and vessels are obscured. There is a less common but related finding called crazy paving, named after the stone tile pattern. In this finding, there are ground glass opacities, as well as superimposed interlobular and intralobular septal thickening, resulting in patchy and well-demarcated regions of grayness within the lung tissue. The CT can show nodules of a wide diversity of size and appearance. A finding that is more specific for interstitial lung disease is honeycombing. In honeycombing, there are clusters of cystic air spaces, typically basal and posterior in distribution. This is most commonly associated with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This particular CT also shows traction bronchiectasis, which is irreversible dilation of bronchi and bronchioles, generally thought to be due to mechanical traction on the airway walls as a consequence of the surrounding fibrosis. A move from radiographic tests to pulmonary function tests. All ILDs have similar findings on PFTs. There is a restrictive pattern on spirometry, meaning that the patient has a normal or slightly low FEV1, which is the volume exhaled in the first second of the patient's most rapid expiration. There is a low FVC, or forced vital capacity, which is the difference in the patient's lung volume between the maximal inspiration and maximal expiration and a normal or elevated FEV1 to FVC ratio. This last finding helps to distinguish ILD from obstructive lung diseases like COPD, in which the FEV1 to FVC ratio is abnormally low. On a flow volume loop, which typically accompanies spirometry, the loop is much smaller than normal, though the peak expiratory flow is normal or only mildly reduced, and unlike in COPD, there is no inward coving of the expiratory limb of the loop. When measuring lung volumes, I already mentioned that the FVC or vital capacity is low, but also all of the lung volumes are typically low, including the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume, with a net consequence of a reduction in the total lung capacity. And if diffusing capacity is measured, it will show a low DLCO, which means that gases have difficulty diffusing across the alveolar capillary membrane the general mechanism of the observed hypoxemia. So now, using all of that information, 
what is the general approach to making a specific ILD diagnosis? A differential diagnosis can be generated by combining the clinical history, that is the time course, smoking history, and other exposures, any extra pulmonary physical findings that might be suggestive of a connective tissue disease, vasculitis, or sarcoidosis, the presence of specific CT features, keeping in mind that some CT findings occur more commonly in some diseases than others, and the distribution of disease as determined by CT, such as apices versus bases, diffuse versus subplural, and centrolobular versus perilymphatic versus random. Occasionally, a BAL and or lung biopsy may be necessary to confirm a diagnosis. And the PFTs, while helpful in establishing the presence and severity of an interstitial lung disease, do not help distinguish ILDs from one another. That's it for this video on ILD. Please remember to like and share it if you found it helpful. And if you have not already seen them, you may find my similar videos on COPD and the interpretation of PFTs to be helpful as well.